We have three more truly remarkable speakers to bring you this afternoon. And the first is Andrew O'Keefe. Andrew designs workplaces that are based on human instincts. And indeed, he's worked with the chimpanzee researcher, Jane Goodall, who many of you may have seen at an earlier conference. He's worked with her talking to business people about social instincts within the workplace. The name of his latest book, and indeed the name of his company, is Hardwired Humans. Please welcome Andrew O'Keefe. Thank you, Julie, and thanks, Beth, and your team for the invitation to join you to share my passion about a vehicle to create happier workplaces. Our happiest moments at work are related to people. Our unhappiest moments at work are also related to people. And here's the challenge that through the long journey of human history, it's only just recently, in 250 years in the Western world, and many cultures are still transitioning through this transition of moving beyond being hunter-gatherers and villagers, to work in workplaces as we know them today. So offices and factories and banks, insurance companies, government offices, are not our natural habitat. We're designed for a different environment in which we now find ourselves. But that also provides the opportunity, if we know what are the basic instincts that come with being born human, then A, we're no longer ignorant of them, B, we have a predictability about why we and others behave and think the way we do at work, and C, most excitingly, we can make wiser choices. If we asked everybody here today, let's say people who work in largish workplaces, or for others, friends and family who talk about their workplaces, and if we asked everybody, what are some of the frustrating, unhappy experiences that you have at work, we would find irrespective of organisation, irrespective of industry, irrespective of country, the list is uncannily similar from one organisation to another. Think about the things that you share at night when you come home. Darling, you won't believe what happened today. Or that close friend and relative who shares with you often in the whinging form, you can't believe what my boss just did today. If we polled everybody, we would find that sure enough, these sorts of things and many others will be on the list. In our organisation, we see a lot of petty politics, internal rivalries and silos. In our organisation, oh my goodness, the boss throws their weight around. My experience at work might be, gee, I've been really quick to be, I've been judged really quickly, but likewise I might have judged others rather quickly. And we heard about this morning the, the importance of suspending judgment. In our organisation, our performance appraisal system doesn't work very well, and those of us in HR are redesigning it one more time, or if you're, if you're a boss, the, 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 the unhappiest moment generally at work is anticipating the performance review of one of your colleagues, or of course if we're a staff member, it's the least satisfying of the conversations we have each year. And in our organisation, you wouldn't believe the power of the informal grapevine, and it's faster and more reliable than the formal channels. Now, if, if these observations are common, which they clearly are across organisations, they're not explainable at your workplace or, or your son, daughter, uncle, aunt's workplaces. They're only explainable because they're common around the world if we identify the common attribute, which of course is that we all employ and work with humans. So ever so recently, we moved from, um, if we were born human, into an environment, uh, uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers, villagers, which for that long journey of human history has, has been our experience. They're the formative years, and then suddenly we get born and we move into workplaces, which can be quite foreign and quite contrary to our instincts. And what's happened is that, so, so my great nephew Hugo, who, who comes in the world born a member of our species, there's a whole suite of behaviour that he doesn't have to learn. So he's clearly a learning, a learning member of a learning species. He learns a lot. He's got a lifetime of learning ahead of him. But there's also a suite of behaviour that he doesn't have to learn that comes naturally. 
Now, I should say at the outset that we're not limited when, when we talk, and Julie introduced around hardwired, it's not that we're absolutely limited to our natural tendencies, but actually, more excitingly, if we're no longer ignorant of them, then we have an explanation and, and a, manage, a working framework. So what's happened is that um, this is really our natural habitat in this individual uh, surviving with, with family, close relatives within a clan on the savanna, in this case, in the Himba tribe in Namibia, West Africa, above South Africa. But in this nanosecond of the journey of, of the human history, we've moved into this sort of state. Separated this person's grandparents' grandparents in the Industrial Revolutions and Midlands of England, as I say, in many cultures, this transition is still happening. We moved into offices and factories. So just to make, I guess, concrete, just one, e one example of this jump from the savannah to workplaces, that build, the building block of human societies is based on small family units of about seven within a clan of up to about 150. Now, if we jumped into workplaces and large-ish workplaces, then we would find that to be most functional and happy, that is, to appeal to the natural energy of humans, we would design our workplaces based on small teams of about seven. And that we would know that if we designed an organisation with asking mere mortal human managers to manage 12, 13, 14, 20, 25, 30 people, then we've designed dysfunction and unhappiness into that organisation and we would fight against human nature. Likewise, if we have really small teams, it's not large enough to feel a sense of identity with intimate others. And then within our clan of 150, which comes linked to our brain size, that in organisations that grow to 80, 100 sort of people, suddenly the old hands will say, when it gets to about 80 to 100, it's not as friendly as it used to be. There's some, some the entrepreneur founders will say, there's someone I just saw in the corridor, I think they work here, I don't know who they are. We're getting to that point of, of tolerance linked to the human brain and our connections that we can uh, productively have. Now we can learn a lot about one social species being us because uh, Hugo comes into the world a member of a social species by comparing and contrast to another. And my favourite example is the chimpanzee because uh, their social structures are so similar to ours. I'll just give one example in the time that we've got. So one of the observations that um, the fantastic Dr Jane Goodall made when she moved into the forest in 1960 in Gombe in Tanzania was it didn't take long to realise that chimps like us are hierarchical and in their case led by an alpha male. If we're talking about another chimp species, bonobos, then we would say they're always led by an alpha female. Now I just want to do a comparison between one fantastic constructive leader of the Gombe group, which is this individual called Figgin. And some years ago when I first met Dr Goodall, I said, tell me about Figgin, who from an organisational leadership perspective seemed to be, if you were a chimp, you would want to live in a community led by Figgin. And she said he was absolutely, the, the, the Gombe group was the most productive, stable, harmonious when Figgin was the leader. And she said what it was, was that he was really powerful but not intimidating. She said what the observable behaviour was that if one individual was what we might say mistreating another, Figgin had the power to discipline that individual. And she said it was almost as though they worked out that they, they would be in danger of copying his wrath. And so they didn't. They got on well together and lived in what she called social harmony. Uh, some years later, Figgin's nephew Frodo became the leader and this seems to be a true to life uh, capture of photo, I said he seemed at the other end of the spectrum. And this might uh, make sense with some bosses that you know or your family talk about, that uh, Frodo was an absolute tyrant. And, and he, he led by brute force and bullying. And what's interesting, a couple of things. One, that the constructive leaders of chimps tend to last as a leader in the wild for about 10 years. The bullies, the tyrants, last for only about two years. And the question might be, well, there's many questions, one of them might be, what happens to a deposed alpha male? 
And the answer is the same rules apply as in Canberra. <laughs> some, it actually, she says, it depends on their personality. Some become the shadow of their former selves. Some retreat to the back bench, <laughs> lick their wounds and try another day. So what are our natural instincts? Um, at my workshop on Saturday, we'll go through these in some detail, and in my book I describe each one, the science, and also how to use them. And the one that I wanted to touch on today, and I should give so credit for this, uh, another hero of mine, Professor Nigel Nicholson from London Business School, it was his original work, and then I've you know, built on and extended his work and apply them. And the, one of the favourite things I get to do is take business leaders to zoos to make sense of us as a species. I just, want to I just want to talk about one, which is that quick impression to judge. And once we know this, the value of perhaps suspending judgment. I'll show you the next slide ever so briefly, about half a second. And if we said, what, what did you pick up in that scene? People would get it very accurately. It was serving coffee, a happy, a happy scene. If I said, what sort of coffee, people would say cappuccino. The great purpose of our quick impressions to classify, which serves us well, is to, these quick impressions to judge is in order to classify. We make sense of things, our experience, all this stimuli which hits us every moment of the day, we make sense by classifying and we classify into binary alternatives such as good or bad. That was good coffee, that was bad coffee. I like that person, don't like that person. They're, that's warm, that's cold. That's good news, that's bad news. We can use this, and I just want to, even in the time, touch on just one thing. We can use this at times when we want to be understood, at times when we want to persuade and influence. Then, in being understood, we really want the listener to classify that A, they get our idea, and B, if it's a moment of persuasion and influence, to classify it and agree that it's a good idea. The speed in which we do so and the capacity of the working memory of the brain is that we've only got two seconds in which to be understood or in which to influence and persuade before the listener jumps to their own conclusions and classifies for themselves, which may or may not be. So the next time you want to persuade someone at work, the next time you want to influence someone, think about this technique, which is I've only got seven words because if we leave our key point, often the emotional point, lower into the discussion, could be way into it for humans 30 seconds, we've missed our opportunity and the person will have classified. And once classified, it takes an awful amount to change our minds. We then start filtering what we're hearing, experiencing and observing based on the conclusion that we might well have jumped to. Here's an example which is, I use this example because it's the benchmark of a fantastic first seven words. So the situation is that uh, when Tony Abbott became the opposition leader at the time of the then emissions trading or reduction scheme, he won obviously the, um, the leadership of the opposition based on opposing that idea and he holds his first press conference. Now he's talking beyond the press to the electorate and he's not really talking to people who have absolutely made up their mind one way or the other. What does he say? And he absolutely nails it in his first seven words and he alters that dynamic in the direction in which carbon trading or emissions trading at that time took. If you don't remember his exact second seven words, even the greater point, what you, you would sort of remember because of the emotion attached to it. And he said, it's a great new tax on everything. That was his pr key proposition, his first few words. And there's obviously one critical emotional point in there, which is a very simple word, tax. And it caused so many in the electorate to go, oh, I, I hadn't thought of it like that. I better pay attention. And that becomes his narrative. So at workplaces, let alone in your personal life, when you want to be understood, when you want to persuade or influence, and of course, if we, um, at times when we're not getting the people's drift, the person's drift, we're seeking, can you, you mean, is that like good news? Is that what you're telling me? We're checking back to say, am I classifying this correctly? When you're putting an idea, 
when you're seeking to persuade, you're making a request, an email. Have you ever received an email where it was a long email and you couldn't make sense of it, which would be you weren't able to really classify. The next time you're sending uh, an email, and it doesn't have to be a very long one, is to think about what am I going to say in those first few words to allow the person to classify and make sense of my point, which allows the person to make sense. That's why newspapers have headlines. In the first few words, we can make sense, i.e. classify what this article's about as we start to read. Phone calls, you make a phone call. And what is it the person's going to hear and understand? Get your drift immediately. One, uh, one that we often face at work, back to that original list, is having a performance review. Let's say um, you're the employee, you come in to have your annual performance review or one of the, your loved ones will be heading off to work today as their performance review. From an individual's point of view, the staff member, to make sense of this review, obviously very much on their mind is just that simple binary alternative, is this going to be a good review? Or am I in strife and is this going to be a bad review? To be an empathetic and sensitive manager, in your first seven words, you would make it very clear what sort of review this is going to be. What you would not say, and the number of times in work life that my boss said this to me, or you might have heard it, you might have experienced this, tell me how you think you went this year. That's, that's, a, that's seven words. Of course, in the staff member, uh, being the attentive, defensive, self-protective, uh, emotional being is at that moment unable to classify, not able, we'd be trying to pick up other clues from the person, from the boss, and for the moment in which I'm unable to classify, I am anxious. I, I had a good year, boss, I had a good year, I had a great year. What could the boss say just to make this a much more happier and productive experience, and this is obviously just one example of very many in our daily work lives. The boss might say, and, and almost always the boss is doing a good review, someone who performed well. So why not say, you've had a terrific year, or congratulations on the last 12 months, or I'm looking forward to this good review. So the value of understanding human instincts is that we come into the world as a member of a social being, there's seven basic behaviours in this framework that A, helps us understand why we and others behave and act the way that, as we do, which, which third, that's first, second, gives us a predictable framework of understanding and predicting ours and others' behaviour so that C, most importantly, we can then make informed and wise choices. Thank you.